other operators. Okay? So if you compute in LM, L, that's why we have something you know, non-trivial in this calculation. In computing this first guy, LM, LN, we have this, where this is an accurate representation of this quantity in that order. Similarly, this is an accurate representation of this quantity in that in this order. Had it been that T of Z was everywhere completely analytic. You know, in, in, regardless of W, then these two contours could, could have been happily deformed to each other and cancelled. Okay? So, uh, this is something that's of course very important to keep in mind. That correlation functions of T will not have this form. You know, will have, uh, are not always analytic functions. They have singularities and points of insertion of other operators. Okay. So, so, so let's go on. So what we wanted to do was to, uh, was to do this, uh, this computation. But uh, then we talked about our strategy of doing this, this calculation. Uh, our strategy of doing this calculation was to fix a particular point in W, let's say this point. And then uh, deform the Z contours. Sorry, it's a bunch of W. Uh, deform the Z contours so that this one goes to you know, surrounding here and then line of the W contour. And this one goes to surrounding here, line with W contour. So that this calculation was the same thing as uh, the calculation of the Z contour going like that. That contour integral picks up the residue, cancelling one of the factors of 2 pi i. And so we have finally that uh, Lm, Ln, uh, is equal to the integral dW over 2 pi i of something. What's the something? The something is the residue as z goes to w, the residue in z, in the variable z, as z goes to w, of z to the power n plus 1, w to the power n plus 1, t of z, t of w. Okay? So this quantity is a residue in z, so it's a function of w, and that function of w has to be is this clear? Okay. So now let's, let's carry this through. Let's compute this, this residue. So in order to compute the residue, we know that z to the power n plus 1 uh, is a completely analytic function of z uh, at w. And so the only possible places of non-analyticity, the only possible source of non-analyticity are non-analyticities non in, uh, in the two-point function between t of z and t of w. Uh, any any contribution to this two point function that is analytic in z minus w will not give us a point here, so we can ignore this. So it's only the normal analytic pieces that are interesting to us. What were the non analytic pieces? The non analytic pieces were t of z, t of w is equal to c by 12, sorry, c by 2 uh, z minus w is equal to cube, plus 2t of w z minus w is equal to squared, plus del t w. That's cool. C by 2. Thank you. Okay. So let's substitute this in. Once we substitute this in, you might think, ah, the only pole is this piece. But that could not be accurate because we've got a double pole here which will give us a pole when we take terms of the Taylor expansion of z to the final plus 1 about z equals w. So let's write that, that data expansion. So z to the power n plus 1 uh, is equal to well, w to the power n plus 1 plus m plus 1 into uh, w to the power m uh, plus there's a term uh, it times z minus w plus uh, m plus 1 into m in by 2 into w to the power n minus 1 z minus w whole thing squared plus m, m squared minus 1 to m by 6 to w to pi minus 2 into z minus w over the cube. We don't need to go further than this order of the data expansion because the maximum singularity was z to the 4. So this is the largest term that can give us a pole. Okay. So now let's multiply this with this and I've isolated the coefficient of 1 over z minus w. So we get three terms. 
we get this multiplying this, this multiplying uh, sorry, this multiplying this, and this multiplying that. Okay, so the three terms are c by twelve times m squared minus one into m. Okay, plus um, this times that side. So two m plus one into t of w plus uh, and uh, we should get our powers of w, right? So this was uh, uh, w to the pi minus two. This was w to the power m. W to the power m, and we also had uh, overall. Right, we have w to the power n plus one in the case of y. So multiply everything by w to the power. <coughs> because this was going along with that. Okay? Uh, uh, plus w to the power m, and then plus uh, del t of w uh, into w to the power So that is this rest. This is the quantity that we have to multiply by dw by d by i and integrate over the quantity. Okay? Now the question um, is well, what, what, what is this stuff? Of course, what we're doing is contour integral of either constant or, or t. So this can be written once again in terms of L. Okay? So let's see how we do that. So let's first take the constant term. So the constant term is w to the power n plus m minus 1 into c by 12 integral dw by 2 pi. Okay? Now, all of these are 0 unless n plus n is equal to 0, in which case we pick up the contribution of the pole, namely 1. Okay? So this is equal to delta of n m. Yeah, m is equal to m times c. N minus n. Thank you. That's called n plus m. Okay, great. Now let's examine the other things. Okay, so the other two terms are actually both very similar and can be converted to each other. Well, let's first write it down. So this is w to the power n um, plus n plus 1 into 2t two, two of w plus w to the power uh, and this is into 2 into n plus 1, I'm sorry. 2n plus 1 plus w to the power uh, n plus n plus power, yeah, n plus n plus 2 yeah. this thing integrated dw by 2 pi okay, now we should really substitute each of these expansions in terms of the power series and L's there's a little trick that helps. That little trick is an integration by parts. Okay? We've got a derivative of t. So we should we could substitute in the derivative of t in the expansion. But it's even simpler just to integrate this by parts. Okay? So if we integrate by parts, what we get is a minus sign here and the derivative of this. Uh, now, this uh, minus sign in the derivative makes the power the same as that, but makes the constant, which was here 2 into n plus 1, minus m plus n 
plus 2 and then the whole thing is w to the power n plus n plus 1 into d w by d. Is this clear? Okay. So what do we have? This is two. No, so two is cancelled. So first is two and two cancel. So we get um, m minus n into w to the power n plus n plus one d of w d w by d by i. And now this is simply m minus n times L of M plus N. Right, because this is the uh, uh, thing you multiply by to isolate out the coefficient of N. Remember that T was like 1 over what was equal to L of M divided by Z by M plus 2. So if you wanted the coefficient of Z, Ln, you multiply by z to the power n plus 1. Okay? So this is z to the power n plus n plus 1. Then what's it? So we've got both pieces in this expansion. So let's sum up what we concluded. We concluded that Lm, formulated Ln, is equal to m minus n Lm plus n. Okay? Uh, plus delta of m plus n from 0 c by n. So the, 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 these commutative relations are sort of well known. They they define what is called the deep symmetry. Okay, it's a very important. These the commutative relations are very important because, as you know, the LNs and LNs are conserved charges. LNs and LNs are conserved charges in our theory. Uh, this commut the commutation relations between the conserved charges defines the symmetry algebra of the theory, just like the commutative relations of the SU two generators. Find the symmetry algebra of any theory with rotation. Okay, so this is telling us what the uh, you know it, this is telling us a lot about what we can say about the theory from symmetry. This is a very important relationship. Okay, now um, there, there is a physical point that I I'll bring up now. And I'll also be talking at the end of the lecture. I'm going to clear that. But anyway, let's let's talk about it. And that's this. Uh, some of you might be worried about the form. I know when I was a student, this kind of thing about me. Uh, look, a conformal transformation is just a coordinate change. Okay? You might have thought, well, it's just you know one of these analytic coordinate changes. And so if you want to know what the algebra of these coordinate changes is. Should be very easy to determine. You write down the vector field that generates the point of change. We know how to do that. We've done it before. It's like z to some power times n z is the power z to the power n plus one or something. Then z, then z is the is the uh, uh, generator. Let's. Um, oh, uh, we get all factors right. So it's something like z to the power n plus one times z is the generator for n n n. So, if you wanted to uh, sit and compute the commutation relations of these symmetric things, it should just be uh, computing the commutation relations between these uh, between these two vector fields, and then you get whatever you get. Okay. Uh, so, you know, why don't instead of doing this fancy calculation, why don't I do that simple calculation? Okay. And when you do do that simple calculation, you get an answer, and the answer turns out to be exactly the same as this, but without this fact. Okay. Now this might seem like something worrying. What's going on? If the symmetry in question was that of these coordinate changes, how can the final symmetry algebra not 
at the actual of these coordinate changes. Certainly, this thing did happen in rotations. The generators of rotations will be the same symmetry algebra as the decimal spatial rotations. So we demand that they do. It's no surprise. So what's going on? How can it be? How can it, you, you know, all of this sounds very like a lot of fancy mathematics, but how can it make any sense? Okay? And the important point here that's missed by this news argument is that a conformal transformation is not just a coordinate change. It's a coordinate change plus a wide transformation. Okay? If you make a coordinate change, if you make a coordinate change, you also change the metric. Right? So you, you make one of these conformal coordinate changes, you also change the metric with it. And then you have to rescale your metric by a wild transformation in order to put the theory back into a theory with flat space. A conformal transformation, remember, conformal transformation, when we're dealing with conformal field theories, you know, when we're making these transformations, we are also changing the metric of which the theory is. So it's a conformal transformation is the product of these two things, these two operations. Okay? Now, in the loose argument, we were assuming that the wild transformation did nothing. Okay? Is it just product or is it subject of the product? Uh, what's again? I mean, is it just a product or? It's a, by product, I mean you have to do two operations. One of which is a coordinate change, the second of which is a wild transformation. I don't want to say something about the global structure of the group or anything like that. Okay? So, uh, this part of, you see, the, the stress tensor, the o, you see, this part of, of the commutation relation that came from the most singular piece, yeah, of the stress tensor, uh, the TTOP, okay, is actually telling you how T transforms under wild transformations. See, this part. It's just the transformation of the stress tensor under a coordinate change. Okay? This part does not happen under a coordinate change. If you just make a coordinate change, that's not how T transforms. So it must be, since this is, the, this is related to how T transforms under a conformal transformation, it must be this part is telling you how T transforms under a wild transformation. So what's happening here is that the wild transformation that is needed to put the theory back into flat space metric is not acting trivially enough. Okay? And it's this additional bit okay, that is giving us this, this, this additional bit. Okay? So this thing is completely physical. This part, you know, this, this, this transformation is not just a coordinate change. It's coordinate change for something else. The, the combination of coordinate changes is giving us this. The combination of the wild transformations. Okay, that's what's going on. We will see this in more detail, probably by the end of this class, where we will use this point of view to calculate. Okay, well, there's no contradiction. It's all perfectly sensible. It makes sense just if you think about it correctly and clean, not losing it. Yeah. That. Okay, uh, fine. So, this is the way that's all of algebra. Any questions or comments about it? Okay. Now, um, let us uh, let us use this data sort of, sort of value huh? Okay. To understand first what was special about primary C. Uh, what was special about primary? Okay, now, you know, whenever I define a term for an operator, I will often, without telling you about it, use the same term for states. And the understanding is always this is the inheritance under the state operator. So we define the primary operator as an operator that has whose only singularity in the TTOP is that of you know, square term and the linear term with particular forms of the sorry, T operator of uh, the particular form of the of the of the uh, uh, residence, the coefficients. Okay? Now we uh, where any state
saying is that it's dual to an operator that obeys such OPs between the stretched ends of its tail. And the operator is going to be called the primary state. Okay? I want to understand what I can say about the action of these L operators on primary states. Okay? How do I understand that? Well, remember what a primary state is. A primary state by definition is obtained by, is the wage function that is obtained by inserting a primary operator O at the origin. And we do the path integral after some point, let's say z equals 1, and we get some state. Fine. Okay. How do I now understand what I get when I act LM on the state? Well, if I want to act LM on the state, I should act with the operator. I should act with the operator t of z, z to the pi n plus 1 by 2 pi i on O of 0, where this quant this 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 quant this integral is taken over this contour C. What is C? I don't care what it is, it's just some contour that's around 0. We know the answer doesn't depend on what contour because everything's analytic except it's zero. I've got no insertions at the part from insertion. Is it clear? Okay? Very good. So, well, uh, the question is, what is ln on 0? Uh, ln on O. Okay, let me invent some notation. Suppose I've got an operator O, the state corresponding to that O. Yeah. Put that operator in. Yes. So I'm trying to compute, compute ln on O. So ln on O, is the state corresponding to state corresponding to to this operator? Okay. So all I have to do is compute what the subject is. Well, how do I do it? Um, in order to do that, I use the OP. Let's see, I've assumed here that O was a primary. Assume, assume see what, uh, what, what we get if O was not, but okay. Let's assume for a moment that O is a primary. Okay, so we get uh, uh, T of Z times O is uh, H O of 0 divided by Z squared plus uh, del O divided by Z times z to the pi plus 1 dz by 2 pi i. And because I'm doing this contour integral, I should be picking out uh, I should be picking out the pole. Okay? I should be picking out the pole. Uh, that's why I've kept only the uh, but uh, well, provided that, okay, I've made an assumption here. Yeah. I've made an assumption, this calculation is correct. This calculation is correct provided that m is greater than or equal to minus 1. Because if m was less than that, then I get contributions to this, to this uh, uh, operator product. I, I, I get contributions that involve analytic terms of the operator product. Cancel the non analyticity of the explicit insertion technique. Okay? But I'm, doing, I, I'm going to do my calculation only for m greater than equal to minus. Okay? This calculation will only receive contributions from the non analyticities of the operator product expansion. These non analyticities are com under complete control because this is by function of the operator. Okay, so that's what we get. Well, we get this term clicks if uh, m is equal to 0. So we get delta m0 times h times o0. This term clicks if m is equal to 1. So we get plus del O uh, uh, 
if n is equal to uh, minus one, m o times uh, uh, delta m minus one, and that's it. Can, uh, can we just using uh, primary operators span the whole equal space? Yes, uh, we will see that in just a moment. Uh, in what sense? Actually? And if the statement is bad, as bad is not true, but as but but a uh, related statement is true. Okay. So this calculation was true for all m greater than minus one. So we get something non-zero only for m equals minus one and m equals zero. Okay, so let's this one. We found that L minus one on O is equal to delta. Actually, this statement is not true for just for primary operators. Completely, it's true in complete generality. So as we said, any local operator, uh, the whole part of the T operator expansion uh, is derivative of operator by. So this part is just will always be true. We've also found that L0 on O is equal to H times R. Again, this statement is more is true in greater generality than for primary operator. It will be true for any quasi primary because it depends just on the 1 over z squared part of the operator. But so this is rather generally true. These two statements are quite generally true. Okay? But this statement, Lm of O. This is O not zero side. I'm sorry, I used that relation, but this is the state O is not zero. Lm of O is equal to zero uh, for all M greater than zero. That crucially used the fact that there were no singularities in the OP beyond uh, uh, beyond inverse quadratic. Like and it's true only of primary. Okay. Now this is a very interesting statement in order to understand what its physical implications are. In order to understand what its physical implications are, uh, I'm going to ask you to remember what these LMs were on the cylinder. Okay. Remember, okay, remember uh, that we had T of Z to be equal to LM over Z to 5 plus 2. Come over M. This plus two was taken away by the conformal, you know, by, by the conformal trans the transformation business, and we got some, we got a T of W which, after some shift, okay, uh, was e to the power i M W L M. The important point, okay, the important point is, is the following. L0 is the zero mode of T of W. And when integrated over the cylinder, and when added to L0 bar actually, well it gives you the energy of the theory on the cylinder. This we've seen we've seen before many times, right? Okay. Now let's look at what we got for the comp. So so remember the physical interpretation of L0 was uh, the energy of states, or the left moving part of the energy of states. So the energy plus momentum of states. Okay? Now let's remember what we got from a B Rasa approach. We got the computational relations Lm, Lm is equal to M minus N, Lm plus N, uh, plus M squared minus 1 into M by 12, was it? C? Uh, by 12c, delta m plus n, 0. Let's now set L0, uh, n equals 0. What do we get? Suppose we set m equals 0, we get L0, ln, is equal to minus n, ln, uh, uh, plus 0. Because the only time that's a function clicks it. 
Okay? That tells us that modes with L, modes Ln have energy minus L. Okay? So if you act to the state of energy E with Ln, the result state has energy E minus L. Therefore, LNs with all Ns positive are operators that lower the energy systems. Whereas LNs with all Ns negative are operators that raise the energy systems. Is this here? Right? Because, because this is minus. So, okay, so, so this is just telling us that uh, these operators and these states which correspond to the primary uh, operators are the lowest. Good. So what is so what does it mean that L F of O is equal to zero for all positive n? Now let's think a little group theory. You see, so whenever you have any, any group implemented in a quantum field theory, okay, any algebra implemented in a quantum field theory, you can take the Hilbert space of the quantum field theory and decompose it into irreducible representations. Into irreducible representations of that algebra. Now, uh, the algebra in question does not commute with energy, but has not the operators of the algebra question we just seen don't commute to the energy operator up there the non-trivial computation relations the energy operator it both raises as well as the energies in the quantum field theory in a sensible quantum field theory I mean we often demand certainly in energy we will do it initially we will demand that the quantum field theory have a lowest energy state ok so it cannot be in such a system that you can act indefinitely with the energy of lowering operators on any state. Okay? So there must be a must be a class of distinguished states in the theory. Such that these states have energies that cannot be lowered further by the operation of the symmetry action. Okay? We have seen that these states, such states are exactly primary states. Okay, uh, we have not seen that all the lower state states are primary states. Well, we have not see, seen it in the words we have done, but you can easily run it through the algebra. You see, suppose we had any OP coefficient, let's say it's one over, like a 1 over z to the k. That will give us a non-zero action of some L with something positive. I have not, I have not said it in these words, but it's too an extension of what we've done to see that. Okay? But, but, but okay, so that just says that if it is a quasi-primary, then it should be a primary. Correct. But we've already argued that it's always possible to use a base. So okay, you're, you're right. You're right. We could you know take two primary states with different weights. And take linear combinations of them. That would technically not be a primary state. Okay? I would still obey the condition that uh, uh, is annihilated by all the operators. Okay? But what, what we have argued effectively is that it's always possible to choose if you take the states of all space of states that is annihilated by all the uh, by all positive ends, then it's always possible that's a linear space. It's always possible to find a basis in that. Such that the basis elements are uh, are uh, 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 such that the basis elements are uh, uh, primary operators. Is it because it's always possible to find a basis which is quasi primary, and then that finishes it? Uh, okay, so when the, but okay, but that is just stated into the proof that we can always use a quasi primary basis. Uh, in this in this space, but well, we've already seen that it's always possible to find a kind of quasi primary basis in the whole space. Okay. So uh, you 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 now want to know whether it is or whether uh, okay let's see let's see let's see well okay good point right. though I'm sure it's easy to make the uh, make make the proof let's see though can we do it on this one 
Um, uh, okay, so you're asking, well, suppose I've got a set of states that is annihilated by all the right operators. Uh, yeah. I mean, the, the question essentially is, can you diagonalize the energy operator in that set of states? Right? Is it quasi-primarity? Uh, okay. Yeah, but I think it's more or less clear. You see, uh, uh, what, 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 uh, uh, Oh, active one zero would mean that uh, the OP between P and O would not have the higher term than one by Z square. Uh, that is correct. So that Lobnagam agrees with. So um, what he's asking is, uh, could it be? Uh, let me get this. What he's asking is that well, suppose we put that condition, then all that we know is that the maximum of us, uh, singularity in the OP is one over Z square. Okay, so any such operator has the property that T of Z on O is equal to uh, yeah, yeah. Let's, let's actually make that. Okay, it's some some other operator, right? So some other operator of O tilde by Z squared, okay, plus del O by Z. Okay, and. Uh, uh, but in our definition of an operator to be primary, okay, we require this O tilde to be the same as O. So you say, how do you know you know? Okay, I'm getting it all the time the basis in such states that where this is satisfied. But how, how do you know? Yeah. Well, you see, firstly, um, <coughs> firstly, notice that for this to be true, it must be that O tilde has the same weight as the same dimensions. Because T is dimension 2, O is some dimension. So these two sides have the same dimension, O till that has to have the same dimension as T. And because this is the dimension of this side of the, of the OP is dimension of O plus 2. We've got the 2 from 1 over Z squared. So this has to have the same dimension as, as O. Okay? So, what, 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 so O tilde is some other, some state corresponding to O, o tilde is some other a state in the inverse space of the theory. Okay? Uh, is some other space in the inverse space of the theory with the same energy as O. So what you have here now is uh, uh, now now let's try to make a uh, let's try to make a you know basis change in the space of uh, so, so so L0 the state O will be the state O. Right? But L0 and the state O will be the state O L0 of the state O exactly, exactly. Exactly. And that uh, uh, for your the thing that you want to diagonalize. Then we're just diagonalizing the Hamiltonian in that. In that. Right. Okay. So let me say again what, what, what we conclude. We've concluded that there must exist a distinguished set of, set of states that are annihilated by all energy uh, lowering operators of the theorems, LMs with M greater than zero. Okay? And it's possible to find the basis of these states such that the, that uh, uh, you know in this basis the uh, the states are dual to primary operators. Okay, now now given any state in the Hilbert space of the theory. Okay. Given any state in the Hilbert space of the theory, let's act on it with lowering operators, energy lowering operators. Either you will run out to energy minus infinity, or you will hit one of these states. Okay. So what we conclude is that every state in the Hilbert space of the theory can be reached. Uh, 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 that it is possible to take any state of the Hilbert space in the Hilbert space of the theory and act with a sufficient number of generators of the symmetry algebra and reach one of these distinguished states. 
Okay? Let's, let's draw what we've concluded with Don. Suppose we take, uh, we draw primary states, so these, 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 these special states which are annihilated by all the learning operators by these horizontal lines. And try to, try to write down the set of all states that you can reach from these five primary states by the action of the symmetric states in the, in the, uh, uh, in the symmetric. What do you do? Okay? You can't act by energy lowering operators in these states, but you can act by energy raising operators. Now, after you've acted by some energy raising operator, you can then act by lowering operators. But that is redundant. It's redundant because you can then take the lowering operator through the raising operators until you annihilate the primary state and be left with only terms in terms of raising operators by using the commutation relation of, of, the, thing, uh, of the theory. Sort of like we do it with J minus and J plus with the computing, computing commutators. Okay? So, you can generate a whole set of states by taking this primary state or this low state state and acting by all energy raising operators in all possible ways. This may not by itself be uh, an unconstrained thing to do, there may be some relations in this, as we will discuss in a bit. Okay? But certainly you can do this. All of these states will give you some powers. Okay. Now, if you take any of these states here, and by acting with lower operators, you can go back to the primary. Unless the state is null. Unless something very funny happens, which again we discussed in some way. You know, it seems reasonable generically, that you can take any of these states here, act with lower states, and get to the primary. So this is the structure. Also, it's clear that there's no limit to how high this down goes. Because you can act with L1 as many times as you L minus 1 as many times as you L minus million, L1, L minus million, and so on, you just keep going. Okay? Yes, yes, yes. That's, 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 that's an assumption. Okay? So the structure of the, the Hilbert space of the theory it has, has this structure. There are these distinguished lowest rate states, primary states, and then you build up modules of the conformal group. Module means just means an irreducible representation. Okay? An irreducible representation that you get by acting on this lower space state by all the raising operators in any way you want. Okay? All of these objects are, are related by action of the symmetric. These states are to be obtained from one another by action of elements of the symmetric algebra. So it's the same representation of the algebra. Okay? Things that you get from different primaries are not related to each other by action of elements of the symmetry algebra and form different representations. Okay? So, the structure of the Hilbert space of the theory goes as follows. The Hilbert space is divided into a bunch of modules or representations, each of which is lower, is labeled by its primary state. Okay? So, the question you would ask in part though, is that it's not true that you can find a basis in the Hilbert space which is spanned by primary operators, but it is true that you can find a basis in the Hilbert space that is spanned by primary operators and LMs for all positive acting on primary operators. Since we know everything about LMs just from symmetry, that's good enough for many purposes. Okay? Any state that is not primary is called a descendant. It's a descendant of a particular primary. If you know everything about that primary, you know everything about that descendant. For instance, if you know the energy of this primary state and you want to know what the energy of the descendant is, well, suppose this descendant was L minus 20 acting on the primary, we know as it knows an exact statement that L minus 20 has energy of primary plus 20. The energy of L minus 20 of the primary is 20 plus the energy of the primary. So we know the energy of the primary, we know the energy of the state. So if we were interested, for instance, in finding the full spectrum of the theory, if we do the spectrum of the primary states, that would be enough. Everything else is done by symmetry. Okay? It's also true, some statement like it's also true for correlation functions. If you know these correlation functions of these guys, you can determine the correlation functions of descendants 
by acting on differential operators, uh, some part of which we discussed. But uh, how do we know that uh, we can never have a state which is actually there in two modules? I mean, in both the modules. Okay, good question. How do we know that uh, this thing? You see, the, the, you see. So, but the basic point is that okay. I mean, we can go up and come down. Come down. Yeah. Uh, yeah I, but I, 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 but I, maybe you can come down to some other primary operator. No, no, no. You see, the coming down is the reverse. See, see, uh, sir. Uh, okay. There is actually one subtlety associated with null states, which we've not yet come to, and which is related to your question. Okay? But ignoring that, let's give a naive answer first. Okay, so let's see. Suppose this state okay, was related to our primary by the action of some uh, some elements. Okay? So, so let's say it was L minus M1, L minus M2 up to L minus M K acting on some primary. Okay, now I want to check what I get. Okay, uh, I want to check what I get. Okay, firstly, how, I'm going to ask, is there a way, is there a way of getting by acting on this state, okay, with uh, lowering operators, so that the resultant state is primary. Okay? So, now this question is completely algebraically answerable. Because, what does it mean for the resultant state to be primary? It means that all raising L's annihilate the state. So, I'm going to ask the following question. Can I act with some, some L's, whatever they are, so that the next result is that LK for all positive K is primary. A, B, C, C, C. Uh, that K, there's no, okay, this that, yes, L, Q. Okay, now there is one way of doing it. Okay, and, and that one way of doing it is as follows. Suppose we choose, you know, lowering operators to kill all these basic operators. Okay, so that we just get rid of all of these. That will do it. But in that case, we just reach for primary P. Now, I, I want to argue that there is no other way to do it. Okay? And the argument goes, as, goes basically as follows. Suppose you've acted with some raising operators, some whatever, lowering operators, to kill some of these L's but not all. You know, you can always, suppose you've acted with, 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 uh, with lowering operators, we we'll always take the lowering operators through. When they reach the primary, they get it. So whatever we have in the end can be written as some number of raising operators on the prime. Either some of the raising operators are left or they are not. If there are none left, then we reach the primary in question and we are out. But if there is something left, let's suppose there's an L minus 2 left. Okay? Then I'll act with an L plus 2 on this state. Now according to the uh, according to the Vira sort of algebra, L, my, uh, L plus 2 and L minus 2. Okay, now I'll, then, then I'll, I'll take the commutator. This thing annihilates the primary. Okay, so L plus 2 and L minus 2 is, uh, uh, is something very concrete. What is it? It's, uh, uh, it's 4L0 plus 4L0 exactly, plus some C into. Uh, uh, into M into yeah some some number so it's well some number yeah okay, three by two uh, uh, acting on this it okay now unless there is conspiracy okay that allows this number to be the same as this number okay. Uh, then, unless that is true, okay, then what we would what we tell is that it's impossible, right? That this is not true. Now, these conspiracies can sometimes happen. They relate it to the, the existence of null states, and what the structure of the Hilbert space becomes then is more complicated. Okay, 
Well, what happens is that there are some states here that then what, what actually, okay, let me just tell you the answer uh, of what happens then, and we come back to studying a little bit more detail. You see, what can happen exactly for this reason that we we'll discussed is that there is a state that is both descend, a descendant of a primary as well as a primary itself. For this reason, that although you can reach it by acting with raising operators on some primary, you can, cannot reverse that, that ascent because the state that would have reversed it actually gives you zero. Okay? But it turns out that whenever this happens, um, actually, you can probably see that by using it, but, uh, but I won't try to do that now. So, whenever this happens, this state has zero norm. This state and all its descendants have zero norm. Okay? So, if you're really interested in a unitary quantum field theory, where no states, no physical states are allowed to have zero norm, you should delete these states from the spectrum. Those states aren't really there. Okay? But either you can take two points of view, either it's an un un unacceptable spectrum, or that it's a mnemonic for a spectrum which does not include the zero states. Okay? In that, basically, in that situation, what happens is that the structure of the irreducible representations of the video sort of algebra has special values. See, there's a special values of N0 and C. You get representations that are different from the generic ones. These represent, you know, a generic representation you'll be able to act with all the elements which are raising in an unconstrained fashion. For these representations, you act with a particular set of elements, you get null states which are, which are just supposed to be zero. Okay, these states are deleted. Okay? So the net conclusion is the same. That even when this happens, there is a single primary for every real state. Because these guys, which could have ended here, don't exist. Okay, so this may not have been terribly clear, but let's uh, we we will get back to this at some point. But any questions at the moment? Just just to clarify. Yes. Is it true that uh, I mean, uh, for a generic uh, representation without this null uh, space? Yes. Uh, is it true that uh, the primary is unique? There's only one state for a one representation. Yeah. That's, that defines it. That's that. Yes. And but for higher dimensions. Ah, you're wondering about uh, you know representations of the. Uh, uh, yeah. You see the equivalent of the spin. See the, what, what happens is that you have a representation of S O D. Right. Now in this case, D is two. You have a representation of S O two. Yeah. So. Which is one dimension. Good. Um, good. Other questions about this? Pathu, are you. I think. Uh, I mean, I'm not. Uh, okay, I know what the conclusion would be. Now I have to clarify how this comes about. Fine. Okay, sounds good. Other questions or comments? Uh, uh, before we go on. Okay. So. Actually, the existence of these null states and these truncated representations is very important because it often allows you to solve these theories. You see, well, the way you do it is that, you know, generically you get some state by acting on a primary state with enough number of elements. Okay? However, in the, for these special representations, if it's a, you know, in a, in a unitary theory, so these states are deleted, by acting with these elements of that state, you just get zero. Now we can sense the make sense statement about correlation functions of operators. In how elements act on operators just by some 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 uh, differential operators. Okay? So some combination of differential operators and any correlation functions of these special operators must be zero. So I can see differential equations for correlation functions of these short operators, which then allows gives you great control uh, over the solutions of the correlation functions. Uh, okay, but that's a throwaway remark for now, uh, which hey, we may or may not come back to. Anyway, okay. 
Sounds good. Okay, so uh, any other questions or comments before we proceed? There you go. So that's my primary operators were special. Okay, they were special in the sense of representation. Okay, so now let's move on. Now let's move on. Um, let me now demonstrate something we use in the derivation of the stress, stress tensor, stress tensor OPE. And the something was this claim that in any unitary theory, the dimension, the scaling dimension of every local operator is strictly greater than zero. And uh, well, strictly greater than equal to zero, and there's a unique operator with dimension zero, namely uh, the identity. Okay. That demonstration is terribly simple. Okay. Suppose I have a, a, an operator of given scaling dimension. Don't care what it is, it's always possible to choose a basis of operators. Given scale, you know, particular scale. Okay, let me, let me let me call that operator O, and let me act with L one L minus one, uh, and let's say that O is a primary operator. Let me first study primary operators. So we have L one L minus one acting on. Okay, by the way, sort of algebra, this is equal to two L zero. There's no central charge term here because remember there was an m in n square minus 1, then square minus 1 is 0. Okay? So now let's, let me sandwich this with an O on one side. Okay? Now this combinate, this uh, um, uh, commutator term, uh, it, it's just exactly. It's just O, L1, L minus 1. Oh, because the other way, L1 and L is prime. And, ah, and now we bring something important that, well, let me first make the statement and then we'll have a discussion. L1 is the, is the uh, permission conjugate of L minus 1. Okay, let me, let me go ahead with the statement and then we'll come back for a discussion. Okay, because of this, this is positive then. And therefore, uh, with this 2h times the O4, this is positive element in a unitary point. Yeah? Therefore, h must be a uh, positive number. Okay? So any local operator in the unitary point of field theory must have, must have positive scaling dimension. Because our proof of the statement assumed that uh, uh, that a that O is a primary operator. And B that uh, uh, L one and L minus one are mutually conjugates. Let's address the first thing. S since we proved that every primary operator has a uh, dimension greater than zero, it immediately follows that every operator has dimension greater than zero. Because if there is an operator with di negative dimension and it's not primary, then there must exist a primary with negative dimension. Because you can keep lowering that, the energy of that operator until you get to primary. Okay? So the first assumption was not restricted. What about this L1 being the emission of L minus This is, of course, manifestly true. Okay? Um, this, is, this is manifestly true because of the way we are doing our quantization. Remember that in the expansion of the stress tensor in terms of W, Okay, what, what, what was that? Let's, let's go back to Minkowski space. What did we have? We had T of uh, sigma and tau, the stress energy operator, or uh, even classically, the stress energy function as a function of sigma and tau, was taken and just Fourier expanded. Okay, was taken and just Fourier expanded um, in, in the following fashion. So, uh, e to the power i m tau. Well, that's it. We, we handle this e to the power i m sigma plus l m plus e to the power minus i m sigma minus e to the power minus i m sigma minus 
ml tilde av f. Og så samler vi over m, og det skal oppnes g om vi samler over g. Ok, now let us first, the first thing of this is classical expansion. In this classical expansion, we demand that t, uh, that we demand that, uh, that t is a real function. Ok? The de that demand of reality tells us the complex conjugate of uh, 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 the, the complex conjugate of t is itself. But in complex conjugating the, this function, we get minus i n sigma plus. Right? Sigma plus just tau plus sigma. Ok? Similarly, here yeah, complex conjugate this function, we get minus i k l k. So how, how do we ensure that the stress energy tensor as a function is real? It's, it's real provided that Lm is equal to Lm star. That's how L minus M is equal to Lm star. No, but sigma plus does not become sigma minus. No, of course not. So there's no connection between the L tilde Oh, sorry, L. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Yes. And similarly, L minus K is equal to L K is Okay? Now, this statement, this statement uh, was about classical functions, but of course it becomes promoted to a statement about quantum operators. The condition once again is we demand that the Hermitian operator. Okay? Uh, the same Conclusion remains when we replace star by that. Okay? So, in the quantization of the theory on the cylinder, this condition will manifest. And what we are doing on the plane, as we have seen repeatedly, is implementing this quantization in a more convenient path in time. So we are not changing any of the conjugation relations. We are defining our Hilbert space on the cylinder always. Okay? Defining norms and you know, commission conjugates on the cylinder. So none of this changes. Okay? So this, this, this is why it's true. Okay. That's why, by the way, we were very careful to define T as equal to Lm over Z pi plus 2. If we did have this plus 2, you see, this plus 2 is what relates this expansion to this expansion. Because of the uh, uh, of the transformation, even the primary part of the transformation between the W and the Z plane. Okay, so it's, uh, you might have thought, why not take T and expand this LM over Z to the power M? You can do that, then LM and L minus M won't be a mission of the It'll be LM and L minus M plus something else, and it'll be a pain in the neck. Okay, so uh, working with the conventions that we have been working with, when they're doing things carefully, these things are all a mission conjugates of each other. I mean, you can add one and add minus one. It's a scale. Okay? So, uh, using the simple space interpretation, we have, uh, we have, just, we have uh, justified one of the statements we used before, namely that in the unitary quantum field theory, every local operator has a uh, positive norm. By the way, let's, let's understand uh, something a little more clear. Suppose H is zero. Well, that implies an L minus 1 on over 0. Okay? What does the L minus 1 on O mean? Do you remember we saw at the beginning of this lecture? Yeah. That L minus 1 on O is equal to L. So we come to an interesting conclusion. An operator has zero holomorphic weight if and only if the operator is anti Delo, delo, holomorphic derivative of that operator is zero. And an operator has both zero holomorphic as well as zero anti holomorphic weight, if and only if that operator is a constant. There's only one constant operator's number. Okay? It's the identity operator. Okay? So, but because we've got this holomorphic factorization in our theory, we reach the most sophisticated conclusion. There are interesting local operators in the theory. T is one. Which 
holomorphic. Such operators will always have anti-holomorphic weight zero. Moreover, the only operators that have anti-holomorphic weight zero are operators that are holomorphic. Okay? Any operator that has a weight of the form h comma zero must obey the equation del bar of that operator. Okay, it's very important conclusion, so it's worth saying many times. Uh, uh, and of course, a cruder version of the statement is that uh, an operator with both weights zero you know, is necessarily constant. It's only one such operator at the end. Okay, is this fair? Um, now, there is. Okay. I hope to start on a discussion. Um, so the plan from now on is, well, in today's lecture, I'm going to complete every general bit of discussion about conformal field theory. Right? From next lecture, on, we start discussing specific. So this Friday, on, we start discussing specific conformal field theory. We start with just a free scalar theory in detail in this language. And we'll try to see some of these abstract arguments work out in you know, more concrete way. Um, but uh, uh, but today we must really complete uh, our general discussion. So the two things that I wanted to say about uh, about uh, conformity theories and generality, both of which have to do with the, the importance and oh sorry first of all and I'm, I'm running out of time, so I'm going to have to do some of this through exercise. Okay, I'm going to suggest exercises for you as outline for logic. I suggest exercises for you to people and request you really to do these exercises. Okay, it's the only way we get to anywhere. Real. You know, we're going to lose too slow this course. But okay. Um, fine. The f okay, first thing, there's another f I, I want to do, I want to suggest what you You see, effectively what we did here was to take Remember, we said that we have primary state at weight h. There's the primary state, and then there are states obtained by acting on that, that, that state with L minus 1s. There are also states that you can get. This has energy 1 above that. Right? What, about the, what, about the state, what about the states with energy 2 above that? Right? Okay? Well, there are two substates. There are two kinds of states that you can get, uh, which have energy 2 above that. These are L minus 1 squared on primary and L minus 2 on primary. Okay? Now, uh, so suppose we take an arbitrary level 2 state. Okay, so firstly it's clear. What I want to do is try a little bit to understand the structure of inner products between states that are descendants of the same primary. Okay? We've already understood the structure of inner products at level 1. We found that, well, there's only one state, so there's okay. But firstly, uh, there are no inner pro no non-trivial inner, inner products between the inner products between states at different levels vanishes. Why? Somebody tell me. Uh, it will become L positive. Uh, okay, because F less and will be positive. Because we have that so that will give rise to a commutation relation with L uh, positive right. acting on primary operators. Okay, that, that, that's one way of saying it's an operation. Of course, it's a very general statement that follows from general rules of quantum mechanics. Okay, now which you can prove as follows. Well. Suppose you've got something at level K, so its, so it's, it's energy is H plus K. And we will be looking at something whose energy is H plus K prime. K prime is not equal to K. Then insert L0. L0 is a mission operator. So acting on this, acting this way, it produces H plus K prime. Acting this way, it produces H plus K. Unless H plus K, K prime is equal to H plus K, this inner product is the same. I think that is standard application of quantum. Usual tricks we can attack quantum. So, the structure of this inner product is only non trivial between states at the same level. So we completely understood what, well, let's say that we work with the normalization such that the inner product is primary with itself as one. Okay? We've determined what the inner product of L minus 1 on the primary with, with itself is. It's 2H. 
Okay, and we got a constraint on H from the requirement that this be positive. Now, let's say we go to, uh, we go to level 2. Okay? Suppose we go to level 2, we'll have um, two states. We'll have L minus 1 squared on O, and we'll have L minus 2 on O. Okay? Now, you can form a matrix, a two cross matrix of inner product from these two states. Okay? Form a, matrix, a two cross two matrix of inner products of these two states. This two cross two matrix of inner products can be computed by using the commutacity relations of the others and the Vivas of Okay? I want you guys to do this calculation. It's a little calculation. Compute this two cross two matrix of inner products uh, of states. Now, suppose you have this computation in your hand. Okay? Suppose you have this computation in your hand. Um, what requirement about what requirement does unitarity impose on this matrix? But unitarity in requires unitarity requires that any linear combination, any particular state you take, has positive value. But any state that you take is some linear at level two. Is some linear combination of these two vectors. The fact that every such linear combination has positive norm is a statement about what this matrix is. Matrix of inner product. Technically, it's a statement that the matrix of inner product is what's called positive, which means that it's all positive eigenvalues. Sorry? Can you say if it's semi dependent Exactly. Exactly. Right. Okay, so positive has some bad zero eigenvalues. Okay? So, what I want you to do is to take this thing, compute the eigenvalues of this matrix, and demonstrate that positivity requires that the central charge of the theory is greater than is strictly greater than zero. That is impossible for both eigenvalues to be positive unless the central charge of the theory is greater than zero. Sorry? No, no. Well, I, 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 it could be equal to zero. Perhaps then one of the eigenvalues would be around zero. Let's let's uh, let's take that uh, possibility out. Okay. But um, uh, once you've done this calculation, we'll discuss it a little bit in class next time. What this calculation shows you is that this business of having you see we had this where we get the C from in the TTOP. We just say, what is the most general possible TTOP? We put that C, but C could have been zero. But this calculation shows you. What this calculation shows you is that C equals zero is essentially a very trivial thing. Actually, I think you can show that if C is zero, then this theory can have only one state or something like that. Uh, when you do the calculation, you examine the answer. Okay? So, this possibility that we talked about, like adding this extra term to the TTOP, wasn't just some mathematical nonsense. In order to get something physically sensible, we must have a non-zero and actually positive central charge. Okay? So that's the first thing I want, I, first exercise I want to suggest to you, which, uh, 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 which I strongly suggest to you. Now there's a second exercise I want to suggest to you. Which I also strongly suggest to you. Uh, I'll outline the exercise in ideas, and I want you to fill in the numbers. Okay? And that's this. The exercise is let us try to see, let us try to say if we can understand, well, the end result of this, this exercise is a very deep result. It is the fact that the dependence of the partition function of a conformal field theory, part integral of the conformal field theory. So far, though, we've been studying this conformal field theory in flat space. But we can study it on any matrix. Okay? The dependence of the, the partition function of this conformal field theory on the metric of the theory is completely fixed 
merely by the central charge. I'm going to write, by the end of this exercise, you write out a formula which tells you what the value of the partition function is given the matrix. By partition function, we pass the integral of the conformity of theory on this path, on this two dimension. Right? This is an extremely important, as you can see, totally non trivial statement. Okay? So let's, let me try to start outlining how I want you to go about this. It's an important exercise, it's dealt with in Polchinski. I want you to do it yourselves, but if you can't and you have trouble, we can discuss it with us. But let me, let, me, let me start by outlining this. Um, the first step in this exercise is to prove, show t mu t mu t mu mu is equal to c by 12. So what's going on? We've got a conformal field theory. We've got a conformal field theory, and. Uh, um, uh, a its stress tensor in flat space is traces. You know, we argue for that, we use it a lot. Now, the claim is that if this conformal field theory is non zero central charge, it would be inconsistent for the stress tensor to be zero when the theory was standard in every health. Okay? And if, but while the stress tensor is not zero, what, what its value is. The trace of stress tensor, what is value is, is independent of the state in the theory. Independent of the particular solution at hand, it's the same for the vacuum in any other state and is given just by the curvature of the manifold in question. This is the claim. Do you understand what the claim is before we go on to, to try to, to, try to uh, uh, explain how you, how you can try to prove it? Okay. Uh, okay. This is not an manifold, which is what is the conditional manifold. But, second holds. We're looking at, this is a local state, actually. Yeah, so as long as it's a manifold in the neighborhood of your point, you don't care about what's happening okay. far away. Yeah. But, uh, but uh, uh, it's not. Okay. How are we going to prove? How are we going to establish this? Well, you see, the first thing that we're going to do is to say, well, this is a statement about a conformal field theory in flax, a in on, on an arbitrary curve manifold. But we are going to figure out how the conformal field theory works in flax space. So can we convert this statement into a statement about the behavior of CFTs in flax space? And that we can. That we can from the definition of, uh, uh, of the stress test. Okay? So let us remember that when you go back and trace through all the definitions, you know, all the factors that we used, uh, our definition of the stress tensor was, was as follows. It says, suppose you have some correlation function, O1 over N in the number car. Okay? Oh, let me be more precise. Suppose we take uh, integral dx into the power minus s and some operators now. And we take that and we vary the metric of the theory a little bit. So the, the change in this correlator upon uh, a small variation of the metric is given by the following. is given by integral of dx of minus 1 by 4 pi, integral of ds is the power minus s, the same O1 over L times uh, Square root g delta g mu nu times g mu. All of this is inside the okay. Yeah. Okay. This was our definition of the stress. We will apply this, this definition of the stress tensor at the moment, but there are better no ones, just to the partition function. Okay? So, a special case of the definition of the stress tensor was delta of, uh, let's call it z, which is equal to integral, 
uh, dx e to the power minus s times uh, square root g delta g mu nu d mu nu. Okay. Now, oh no, sorry, I made a mistake. We would, in order to print this, I don't want to apply this to. Uh, I'm going to apply it to the insertion of one place on the test. Sorry. So delta of, let me call this, expectation value d mu mu. Okay. Now the next step. Okay. Now the next step. What I'm going to do is to choose a particular form is to choose a particular form of this delta g. I'm going to choose delta g mu nu. Okay, so I'm going to work around flat space and choose delta g mu nu to be equal to e to the power 2 w times g mu times tangent w. Okay, so I'm going to choose this two levels. In w small. I'm going to change my metric to e to the power of w times g mu w will be small, so the change is 2w times e w. Again, I plug this in here, I plug this in here, and I find the formula the delta of t mu mu at x is equal to, okay, uh, so the change in t mu mu at x, when I change the metric from eta, to eta plus 2 omega times by its conformal factor is equal to, and now I work the leading order in omega. Okay, so I'll drop the square root g, this is dx e to the power minus s um, times this factor of 2. Uh, I've dropped my 1 by 4 pi, so that becomes a minus 1 by 4 pi. Okay, times uh, uh, t of y, t mu nu of y, t mu nu of y, t mu nu of x, integrated omega of y, integrated over y. Is this clear? Okay? Now, at the next step, So the leading order in omega t mu mu, which we claimed was c was c r by 12, that, that we just have to expand r to leading order in omega, and I'm going to ask you to look up the factors. I will pass a minus two tenths. I think plus two tenths squared. Okay. Working just infinitesimally near of that space. Okay. Then the demonstration that this statement is true would be the same as the demonstration that this statement were true infinitesimally near of that space is the same as the demonstration that minus 1 by 2 pi. Uh, 
t mu mu of x, t mu mu of y. is equal to c by 6 del squared of delta x. This is the thing we have. At least this statement being true requires. Okay? We can also argue that when this is true, we can show that it's true. Okay? But at least this thing we want. We want to first check. Okay. So the question we're asking, so we want to show, we want to show. Uh, I hope this factor of 2 and sine is right, that, that depends on this, this thing which I'm, we have some number but I can okay. So what uh, are, I could look it up, but okay, that's fine. So we want to show that t mu mu of x, t mu mu of y is equal to minus uh, c pi by 3 del squared of this. Now, how do we address such a question? Okay? Uh, how do we address such a question? Well, so far in all that we've done, we've said nothing about the place of t. We just said that is zero. You know, that, that, that thing was just zero. We know a lot about t, z, z, a lot about t, z, z, z bar, z bar, but we know nothing about t, z, z bar, which so that, that's zero. Certainly, the expectation value of that operator is zero, but could it be somehow that there exists such an operator? That, that, that there is four states of such an operator, non zero, two point function, even in flat space? Well, let's see. Let's see. The okay, game is that, that yes, that, 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 that. You see, this two point function is very small. It's non zero everywhere except the contact points. Such things are very subtle. These things are associated with curing divergences or regulate fact, uh, things associated with regulation of one of And a very subtle thing, right? Okay? So, of course, if we've got some nice here, power off, power off, that would have been a gross violation of it. everything that we've been talking about. It would just be inconsistent. But what we all want to be as contact term, it's very hard to get right. So, it could be that when we do things and define correctly, there should have been this contact. Now I'm going to argue for you that we're forced to have such a one. Okay? And the argument, well, oh yeah, oh yeah, okay, I'm going to outline this for you soon, and then we'll, I, I'm going to ask you to try to fill it up. To, the next time in class, maybe I'll give you another way of thinking. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I, we won't finish anything yet. 